Let's pray. We love your word, O oh God. It is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword piercing to the division of soul and spirit, bone and marrow, and revealing the secret things of the heart as nothing else can do. So protect me from merely speaking my words, which would be so fruitless. And grant that I would be faithful to draw out of this text your holy intention. Just like John drew it out of Caiaphas' Caiaphas's word. Come, Holy Spirit, anoint my mouth and let there be a converting power and a strengthening power and an edifying power and a reconciling power and a mobilizing confidence-giving power and a peace-giving power and do exceedingly and abundantly beyond all that we could ask or think by your powerful holy word, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Lazarus has been raised from the dead by the omnipotent word of Jesus, verse 44. Many people have seen it. Some of them believe on Jesus and others run to the Pharisees and tell them what happened. And what happens next in this text shows the fear among the Jewish leaders that finally brought Jesus to execution. Verses 47 and 48, let's read them again. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, what? are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go, if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Now, the council here, as you know, is the Sanhedrin. This is the supreme court of the Jewish nation. It doesn't get any higher than the Sanhedrin, the council. So this issue here is huge. Heaven called a little court. This is huge. This is no longer the issue of mob violence, like we saw in chapter 10, verse 31, ready to stone him because of blasphemy as they heard it. This is high-level federal consultation. And what's at stake, as you saw, is not the truth. This council does not care about finding truth. One thing is at stake, survival. If more people keep believing on him, they say, the Roman Empire, which owns this nation, will come and crash down on them and shut this down with horrific outcomes, as in fact happened about 40 years later. Why would that happen? What are they, how are they thinking? The way they're thinking is this. This Jesus, remember this from chapter 6, verse 15, is viewed by thousands of these people as king. Remember, they were ready to come and make him king. And he had to run and hide because he doesn't want to be declared an earthly king. But that's the mood of the moment. If this goes on, and he just raised somebody from the dead, if this goes on, they're all going to say this. They're all going to be saying, the king has come. The long-expected Messiah is here. The king has come. And what will the Romans think of that? That's the issue. They will think nothing of it, and they will crush it with all their empire might. And this place, the temple, and this people will be history. That was the reasoning. 
Jesus is now not a little blasphemer that needs to be stoned. He is a threat to the existence of the nation, Israel. That's how they see it. The one who came to be the Savior is now viewed as the destroyer of the nation. So ironic. So, in response to this really critical situation as they see it, and it was, it was. Caiaphas has a solution. And what we're going to see in a moment is that his word is not his word only. He did not speak this of himself. It is the word of God. It's kind of breathtaking when we listen. Let's read it. Verses 49 and 50. One of them, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all. Nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. So he rebukes them. You're all upset because you don't understand anything. I'll tell you the solution. Kill him. For it's better that one man should die so the nation won't. We kill him so the Romans won't kill us. We substitute Jesus for us. Now, verses 51 and 52 are the central and most important verses in this text. It's John, the writer of the gospel, interpreting Caiaphas' word as God meant them. So skip them for a moment, and let's finish the chapter for just a second and come back and spend the rest of our time on 51 and 52. Jesus knows things are volatile. His time has not yet come, and so he goes into hiding. A little obscure town near the wilderness, verse 54. Jesus, therefore, no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there to the region near the wilderness to a town called Ephraim, and there he stayed with his disciples while things cooled down. Now, the great feast of Passover is coming. This is the one where he's going to be finally executed. Verse 55, the Passover is on the way. The crowds are swelling in Jerusalem. Things are becoming increasingly unstable. On top of that, Jesus' name is in the air. People are asking, verse 56, where is he? Is he going to come? This is like dry kindling ready for a messianic, Zionist match to be thrown on it. And the whole thing explodes and, and Rome crushes it. 57, verse 57, the final outcome is in place. The decision has been rendered by the council. It is this, if anyone knew where he is, he should let them know so they might arrest him. That's going to take us to Gethsemane before we're done. Okay, now back to verses 51 and 52. Caiaphas, high priest, verse 50, said, it is better for you that one should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. And John, writing the gospel here says uh, there's more meaning here than what was intended by Caiaphas. And here's his understanding. Verse 51. Caiaphas did not say this of his own accord. There's another will going on here. There's another actor, another speaker. He didn't say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied 
that Jesus would die for the nation and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. This is a massive text. I'd like five weeks on this text. But I will give you a summary of those five sermons instead. So there are five truths in this text, and then I will walk through them, I'll I'll name them, walk through them, come back and apply them to your lives, and that's the plan. Here's the name. There are five massive truths here that will affect your life for the strength in hard times, comfort in the face of your own sin, confidence that God keeps His promises, large-heartedness when you're tempted to be narrow and self-centered, and joy in the very personal, particular love of God for you, not in general, but for you in particular. Those five things I'm going to point out. So let's see the truths. I'll give you the truths in the text and then the application. Number one, God did not just turn the national crisis For Israel's good and our good, he was in it from the start, planning it. See the difference? Does God see a difficult situation and fix it, turn it, or is he in it from the start, managing it, planning it? And I'm arguing that's the case because of what this text says. So notice carefully what John says about Caiaphas' words. Verse 50, it's better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. And then John says something amazing in verse 51, he did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, He prophesied, he prophesied of God's accord, not his own. He prophesied of God's accord, not his own. Now think that through. God brought these words out of Caiaphas' mouth. God put them there. God has a meaning. At one level, these are Caiaphas' words, and his meaning is one thing. At another level, these are God's words, and his meaning is another thing. And the point I'm making here is, these words sealed Jesus' death. These words were the death warrant of Jesus. God spoke these words. Caiaphas wanted Jesus dead and out of the way. So he spoke these words. And Jesus wanted Jesus, God wanted Jesus dead and risen and reigning and triumphant over the world. And he spoke these words. He didn't arrive on the scene here late and say, Oh my, what will I make of these words? He spoke these words. That's amazing. I mean, my whole life is based on things like that. You think your troubles, God says, oh no, what will I make of that? That horrible mess. I'll figure it out. That's not my God. Caiaphas prophesied, that is, he spoke God's words, and God said, it is better for you that one should die for the people. 
and that the whole nation should not perish. God said, better that he die. God said, better that he die. God said, better that he die. Better indeed, better than any plan in the universe. Infinitely better that he die. I love God. I love God. He did this with you in mind. I mean, that's coming later. That's point five. We're on one. But it's just too good to wait. Therefore, the, the death of Jesus was not mainly a tragic set of events which God turned for good. It was a loving set of events that God planned for good. God himself served the death warrant on his son. He didn't just predict it. He unleashed it. This word of prophecy tracked Jesus down to Gethsemane and put him under arrest. There was no escape because God had spoken for us. It is better. That's point one. Number two. Substitution is at the heart of the Christian faith. Get this if you get anything. Substitution is at the heart of the Christian faith. If you go on any kind of interview show and they say, what's the heart of your faith? Say the word substitution. And then when they say, what do you mean? Go for it. (laughs) Verse 50 It is better for you that one man should die for, for, in the place of the people, not that the whole nation should perish. Verse 51, second half of the verse, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. In the mind of Caiaphas, the substitution was this. We kill Jesus so Romans won't kill us. We substitute Jesus for ourselves. In the mind of God, the substitution was, I will kill my son so that I won't have to kill you. You. God substitutes Jesus for his enemies. Now, I wonder how you feel about the word kill. I, 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 I'm sitting there at my computer and think, should I say this? Should I say God killed Jesus? The word kill just connotes sin. It connotes callous, murderous. It's got so many connotations. I shouldn't say that. God killed Jesus. And I, I, I don't want to cause anybody to stumble. I don't want you to see God in a wrong way. Here's the reason I said it, and I'll probably say it again before I'm done. I say it because of the way God talked in Isaiah 53. I'll read you just a few verses. You know these. This is maybe the greatest chapter in the Old Testament for knowing what Jesus was up to 700 years from then. Verse 4 We esteemed him stricken, smitten by God. (laughs) By God. Smitten by God. Or, verse 6, the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all and crushed him. In fact, that's what it says in verse 10. It was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. I wouldn't venture to talk like this if I didn't see it in the Bible. I wouldn't risk it. So, substitution. God taking his son and putting him square where I belong and bringing his hand down on him where he should have brought it down on me. 
This is the center of our faith. If you ever want to bear witness to the center of Christian faith, go here. We are the people who believe God substituted his son for sinners so that sinners could live forever. Sins forgiven in his presence as his family. This is our faith. You can say it pretty quick. Infinitely glorious. That's number two. Substitution is at the heart of the Christian faith. Number three. There is a future for the people of Israel as a redeemed ethnic nation and as part of the single blood-bought body of Christ. Say it again. There is a future. I mean, from, de- from this day, 2011, there is a future now for ethnic Israel, not just spiritual Israel, but ethnic Israel And they will be part of the blood-bought body of Christ as his redeemed ethnic nation. Now, this is real controversial, and uh, I don't have time to defend it. I have ex- tried that in Romans 11 when we preached through Romans. You can go read it there. I mention it because it's just so prominent here, and I want you to know how I take this text and What a massive implication I think it has. There are wonderful Christians that I love with all my heart and hang out with who don't agree with me. So you need to know that too. Verse 51, middle of the verse, Caiaphas prophesied, that is, God spoke and said, Jesus would die for the nation, the ethnos called Israel. Not just individual Jews, I interpret, but for the nation. Eventually, the nation of Israel as a whole will be saved. Not every past individual Israelite who rejected the Son, we know they're doomed because the Pharisees are perishing, Jesus said. People are fleeing into the kingdom from north and south and east and west, and the sons of the kingdom are being cast into outer darkness. Not all individual Jews are saved, any more than all individual, any religion is saved. So I'm saying to die for the nation is to seal the covenant for the nation and that the nation someday will coalesce around Messiah Jesus and be saved. Last week I gave some provocative words. I'm going to give you another provocative sentence. Last week's provocative sentence was, no one can be saved unless he becomes a Jew. Meaning, everyone must believe on Jesus the Messiah and so be united to him, the offspring of Abraham, so that they may become heirs of the promises made to the world through Abraham. It's the only way you can be an heir of the promises made to the world through Abraham has become a seed of Abraham in Jesus by faith. Now, here's the provocative sentence today. The Jewish nation cannot be saved unless it becomes part of the Christian church. Meaning, in Jesus Christ, their salvation comes to them And only in Jesus Christ, their Messiah, and in coming to Jesus, they join with us, Johnny come lately, Gentiles in one body called the church. Hasten the day. So, you need to know, as I read the Old Testament and the book of Romans, I can't escape the truth that God's covenant with ethnic Israel is irrevocable and will not be satisfied in its fullness until some future generation of ethnic Israel as a whole turns to Christ and is saved by becoming part of the body of Christ with Gentiles. Paul asked this, 
This is Romans 11, 11. Have they, meaning ethnic Israel, have they stumbled in order that they might fall? God forbid. Their stumbling brings salvation to the Gentiles, and the salvation of the Gentiles will eventually bring Israel to her Messiah. 